What movie or series lit your fuse and made you have to tell stories on screen? So I grew up in Montreal, which felt like the other side of the planet. From wherever it was, people made stories on screens. Um, and I was, I was a pretty hardcore theater kid. I loved theater. I did a lot of theater. And I remember as a kid uh, and a teenager, there were several movies and shows that made me crave being a part of that world. And that was a, an eclectic kind of uh, batch of influences from the predictable Star Wars and Back to the Future, but also like Sane Elsewhere uh, was a show that I would watch every Wednesday, 10 to 11. And I remember kind of being astounded that a made up story on a screen could make you feel the way that show made me feel. Yeah, man, there, I mean, th there were, you know, that was a, that was a Bruce Paltrow series. And later in, in my career, I met Gwyneth and I had, I had had kind of a, a challenging early childhood. There was, you know, my mom had some drinking issues. And when St. Elsewhere was on, I remember that that was my weekly catharsis, that I could count on that show to give me an emotional kind of purging that I needed, but couldn't quite articulate. And it, you know, it was David Morse, it was Howie Mandel, it was Denzel Washington, but there are moments in the last five minutes of certain St. Elsewhere episodes that I could still describe to you. And I will, if you encourage me, uh, but moments like there's an episode uh, that Denzel, it's Denzel's character. He's one of the resident doctors and he's training to be in like a marathon or some long distance run. And the episode ends, again, Goosebumps describing it, with him running through the streets of the city sometime in the middle of the night. And he's running and he's running as if he's finishing that marathon. But then it cuts wide and he's just a lone man crossing a non-existent finish line, but having achieved something that meant something to him. And those kind of moments that are so poetic, where the idea is so rich and the visuals tell a rich idea and a rich emotion, uh, St. Elsewhere abounded in those. And then I went, I came down to the US and I went to Yale as an undergrad. And when I was in junior year, and again, I was still just kind of thinking theater, 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 I was directing theater, I was acting in theater. And the Yale Film Society screened Peter Weir's movie, Gallipoli. And it was on a big screen. And I was like 19, 20 years old, and it knocked me out. The thing about Gallipoli, and the thing that I've since noticed in a lot of Peter Weir's work, which is the work of a master, uh, is he knows how to stick the landing. It's something we talk a lot about, the Duffer Brothers and I, as far as, the audience will let you get away with some narrative meanderings in the middle, but you better open strong and you got to stick the landing. And there are major filmmakers who I won't name right now, who have built careers on sticking the landing and we forgive them soft middles. Uh, but Gallipoli, you've spent the whole movie following this unlikely friendship and they're now at the front. And Mark Lee, who was a musician, uh, plucked from obscurity uh, by Peter Weir is about to make the assault and run towards the enemy. Mel Gibson has gotten a message that they don't need to go when that whistle blows. And the last three minutes of Gallipoli, you're intercutting between the trench and it's either Albioni's Adagio or Barber's Adagio. It's a mournful, elegiac, piece of classical music cutting to Mel Gibson. And again, the movie is about sprinters. So that whole motif, right? Like the best movies are the ones that pay off setups and motifs and call them back in unexpected ways. So these are two friends who got to know each other by running, running fast. And now Mel Gibson is running fast to save the life of Mark Lee. And if he doesn't get there in time, if that whistle blows, he's running to his death. And, I, and it cuts between the classical music and what I recall is Jean-Michel Jarre 
I might be mangling his name, but it's Jean-Michel Jarre. Right? And it's so you have the dichotomy of the sound edit, the music, juxtaposition, and cross-cutting, the visual cross-cutting, and then of course the whistle blows and Mark Louis has to run. And the movie ends, it drops out all the rest of the sound and it's running with him in profile. And at a certain point, I think he even drops his gun because he's not even running with the illusion that he can do anything of worth with that gun. He's running because that's what he was ordered to do. And he's running to a different finish line. And that finish line now is death. And we run with him and all the sound vanishes. And it's just, <sighs> and then three gunshots. <sighs> and you see him in the moment of his death and the movie freeze frames and goes to black. And I remember sitting in that theater in 1988-89, just weeping. I couldn't move, I didn't want to talk, and I never knew that a movie could hit you that deeply. And still, as I describe it to you now, decades later, it hits me that deeply. And I remember, that moment and that movie as the first time I really thought about, well, who makes these stories? And what a thing that would be to be able to combine image, music, character, dialogue, art, composition, photography, all these different crafts to make people feel something powerful. And for me, Gallipoli by Peter Weir was that movie. And I didn't know how I was gonna get there. And, uh, but I just knew I needed to try. On your way up, what movie or series did you watch that was so good it made you question if you could ever rise to that level? Like many of the people who have done this feature uh, on Deadline, there is always a little bit of that gnawing sense of, I'm not sure I do belong, but I'm just going to keep hustling and working as hard as I can until someone stops me. And, you know, that's kind of how I go into every day. But I remember uh, seeing Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. And I think I was either in film school or I had just come out of film school. And I remember coming out of the Century City movie theater. I was somewhat new to Los Angeles. And I remember thinking, man, I should just hang it up. Because that guy, that filmmaker has a whole world inside him. And he's able somehow to marshal every single aspect of the filmmaking process to create a singular world. I would put Wes Anderson in that same category. But that movie, Romeo and Juliet, I was like, I I'm never gonna be able to create a world. And the truth is, to this day, I don't think of, my someone, um, of myself as someone who can build a world with that level of consistency, thoroughness, and movie to movie uh, repetition. I've ended up consoling myself by kind of accepting that, well, I'm a different kind of filmmaker and I build the world to fit the story one at a time. And that's why Real Steel looks different than Date Night and different than Free Guy. And so I try to build worlds, but I remember seeing Baz Luhrmann's work and Moulin Rouge is the same thing and pretty much everything that Baz has directed is the same thing, where there's just a rigor, a rigor to the aesthetic that is all-encompassing, merciless, relentless, and flawless. Whether it was your own work or approval from someone who mattered to you, what first gave you the confidence that you belonged? Can I share two examples of moments that were kind of really meaningfully validating and such that they stick with me now, years later. When I did the first night at the museum, uh, I was like the comedy guy. I had done Cheaper by the Dozen, Pink Panther, Just Married, like suddenly I was asked to bring a huge idea and a world to life. And I remember somewhere either in prep or in post, I was sitting and talking with Chris Columbus. And I was going on as younger directors sometimes do about, no, no, but like, I want to start making edgier, fair and darker movies. And I remember Chris saying to me, why are you running from the thing that comes naturally? Most people can't do what you do. Don't run from it value it, have gratitude for it. And years later now, I'm still making warm-hearted, populist popcorn movies. And 
I no longer resent it because it comes naturally to me. I embrace it because we all have to ultimately look at the tools we're given, right? A lot of the people I know, I'm sure everyone knows, who are discontent into their 40s and 50s and at any age are the ones who are have an idea of themselves, but they don't have the toolkit to build it, that self. So that was a key lesson for me of embrace what you can do and value it. Uh, the other was Steven Spielberg. And it's when I showed him the first cut of Real Steel. Steven was one of the producers on that movie. And when the lights came up at the end of Real Steel, it was clear that Steven had been quite moved. And I remember he said to me, you direct like you're sitting in the audience. You direct like you're the one in that dark theater and you put on the screen what you would want to feel and see. And that really stuck with me, not only because it was words from the great one, blessed be he, uh, but also because I've never thought I was the smartest or best director, but I do trust what I feel audiences want to feel. But I had not articulated it for myself till Stephen put it that way. So you direct like you're sitting in the audience. That was a big moment for me and it's something that resonated and still does. What was the biggest obstacle you overcame that allowed you to turn the projects that influenced you into your own language? I think at a certain point, I learned that I can admire many films and filmmakers who are nothing like what I can do. And learning to differentiate, like I love a great Fincher film. I love a great Michael Mann film. I love a great Steven film or Baz Luhrmann film. That's them. So it's taken me a while. I'm now in the process of editing my 13th feature, which is an astounding stat as I say it out loud. Uh, but I think that what the key kind of developmental step was being free enough to do me. I'm not them. I admire them. I'll go to all their movies every damn time. But what I do is something different. It has its own value. And just learning to value the stuff that I do know how to do and getting maybe better at picking material that plays into that sweet spot for me, which is a resonant thematic idea, comedic elements, visual spectacle, but at the end of the day, a warm, beating, unapologetically humanist heart. That's what I know how to do. And so accepting that, embracing that, that's made all the difference. How has the explosion in streaming changed the way you work? You know, I've been very lucky that my company, 21 Labs, has grown the way I dreamed it would. And I'm able to make much more than just what I direct. And so as a producer and as a filmmaker, I look at the landscape and on the one hand, I'm incredibly grateful for the variety of options in terms of being able to make things and get it seen. And that's been a very fruitful new era for 21 Laps. And uh, we are currently making a lot of different movies for streaming platforms as well as a lot of shows for Netflix. Uh, as a director, you know, Free Guy's coming out in the movie theaters. I don't know what that outcome will be. We are an original, big budget movie in a time of, you know, uncertainty and in the theatrical marketplace. As a filmmaker, I'm not gonna bullshit you. I will admit that seeing the work that me and my collaborators do, as big and as loud as possible, that is still my great joy. That is still deeply gratifying. But I also recognize that the other goal, especially of the kind of work I do, which is large audience populism, the available eyeballs exist in a lot of places beyond the movie theater. And so the optionality, to use a slightly annoying overused word, um, I'm, I'm, I'm embracing it. Because A, we can fight it and we can stomp our feet, ain't gonna change it, that's number one. But the truth is, I like that the stories I tell and that my collaborators tell will find their way to a lot of people around the world, many of whom wouldn't have even necessarily been able to get to a movie theater. And so 
as with all things in life, I'm choosing to embrace and lean into the positive aspects.